We're going to look at Peter, Peter's uh, second letter today, just a section from it, and um, just give me a second to find it. Peter's second letter, probably the main theme of the letter is um, knowing. It's a word that recurs 16 times in this short three chapters, 16 times. I mean, if you repeat something that much, it means something. And he's saying the intent of this letter is that you may know, may know, be grounded, reminded, to, to know it, to be certain of something, to be sure of something, to, to not have to doubt it, to be sure, to be confident. 16 times he uses the word knowing, knowing, so that you may know, so that you may know. He starts he's saying, greeting the people in the name of Jesus. And he says, I'm writing this, and may the grace of God be with you, that you may know, that you may know. So the whole time he's just writing about knowing and certainty. And we're busy with the series, just considering your devotional reading of Scripture at home. Last week, in our small groups, we looked at the first session of the Lectio course. And Lectio, literally, Lectio Divina, is just an old Latin name that just means the way in which people read the Scripture through the ages, sacred reading of Scripture, the reading of the sacred Scripture, sacred reading. So prayerfully reading Scripture, not reading Scripture to study it like laws, not reading scripture for inspiration, you know, to be like a hero of the faith, like a David, not reading scripture to, to know how to practically solve problems or deal with ethics, but to know scripture that you may know God and be known in him. So the heart of the intent of this reading is, is literally that, and it's a simple message style. I use four English words in this next slide, just so you can see that the intent is to read the scripture and that's what we'll focus on today, to read Scripture, to read it, to pay attention to it, Peter says. You'll do good to pay attention to the Word. <laughs> and then nextly, to, to reflect. Just go back one slide, please, Mackie. Next is to reflect, to be mindful. It's what the psalmist says, blessed is the man who meditates on this day and night. To think about it, to put your thoughts to work, to let your brain, use your sanctified brain to think about what does this mean. Thirdly is to respond in prayer, to say, God, this is what I understand, but to have a conversation with God about the Bible, to actually pray, say, God, this is what I hear. God, I use this text as a prayer to you because I can identify with something why I don't understand something. And then lastly is just to rest in it, to read it, and to trust God that God, I pray that this word doesn't just sit in my head, but just becomes part of my life, that my life becomes a, a witness, like Jesus became the living word. I pray that in somehow my life, that, that this will, be, will guide my internal subconscious actions, that I may be a loving person and love you more. So it's a simple way of reading the text. It can take you five minutes and it can take you an hour. Simple reading of the text. So let's, let's consider Peter, but just before I consider Peter today, um, it's amazing, Mackie, the next slide shows the background of Peter's text. So Peter is writing, and you have to, you have to start here, because this letter was written to a, it's not written to us, it's written for us. There were like a real bunch of churches that were undergoing hardship during the reign of Nero, <laughs> Emperor Nero. So these Christians were frayed because their fellow brethren were burnt at stakes alive, were crucified, were fed to the animals, were beaten, were ostracized, were intimidated, were denied public access to basic things in life, not being allowed to partake in certain work circles. So, so these people were, it was a tough time. It was a tough time. It's like being a French rugby player in Paris at this moment ostracized from what's happening in your own stadium. You know, you can't partake of, of the enjoyment of everyone else. You know, it's like, it's like, I'm joking, but the point is the guys were outside of life and pressured. Alienation and persecution was the, was the game. Peter's writing this, he's writing this about 60 after Christ, just before Nero was crazy enough to set half of Rome aflame to blame the Christians, to give him more power because the gospel was gaining advance, didn't work in the end for him well. And Peter's writing and he's saying, listen, so let's be blunt. I don't know if he was arrested at this point, but he doesn't say that. But he's saying, the Lord showed to me, but my life is about to end. 
I'm about to be crucified. And we know history, crucified upside down in the Colosseum in, in Rome. So he says, I know my life is about to end. So I'm writing this with a certain urgency. <laughs> this is my last words. This is my last words. And then the whole point of the text he's saying is to ground you in that you may know this as truth. I love, and you'll see what he says now. He says, I'm writing this to you because I've said this to you in the past. I don't find it tiresome to say it to you again. And he's saying, I'm going to make it my life's work to record this so that you will never have an excuse to forget what is important. And he said, you'll do well to pay attention. You'll do well to pay attention so that they may be resilient and fruitful in this hostile culture. And he's answering three questions. We will only touch on the one today. He's saying, the, in the church during this time of persecution and uncertainty saying, listen, my life isn't working out this well. I said yes to Jesus. And it doesn't seem as though I am a more than a conqueror in Christ in this moment. You know, my, I'm ostracized, I'm poor, I'm afraid, I'm intimidated. My life isn't going that well. You know how many people pastorally I see, we see, let me say this blunt, that when things get tough, they say, I must have heard God wrong. And I'm like, how do you read the Bible? <laughs> you know how many people I've seen in my, in my office over the years saying, I must have married the wrong woman because life is difficult. We're fighting. And I'm like, no, you are the wrong person. <laughs> sin, was like, sin, you know, it's like God taking Noah and everyone into the boat to save the world. And then Noah and his family brought sin on board. You know, it's like the same point. You know, many people are saying, because, you know, I heard from God that I should really start this or I should speak to the school about this thing and then things get tough on them. I must have heard God wrong because life is tough. He's saying to them, they're saying three objections. Firstly, the church was saying, you know, this whole apostolic story was just a myth. It's just a myth. I mean, a dead man raising from the dead, walking on water, multiplying bread, healing the eyes of the blind. It's just a myth. But the problem is, this was 25 years after Jesus walked among them. It's a bit too soon for a myth, you know. Secondly, saying, no, there won't be judgment. Some teachers are saying, man, you can partake in all these feasts and orgies and alcohol and, and still believe in Jesus. It doesn't, you know, you're saved because your sins are washed away. You can do what you want. And he's saying, near puppy, you must be pint. There is a real judgment. And thirdly, saying there will be no return. You know, we're waiting and people are dying. But when is Jesus? Jesus said, I'll be back soon, you know. And I haven't seen him come down. I, when is he? That's just a story. Jesus isn't really returning in the physical flesh. So chapter one, he denounces the myth. Chapter two, he denounces saying there will be a judgment. Chapter three, saying there will be a return. And all three of those answers, he's saying the word said so. The word, the word, the word. And it's amazing. Peter's writing scripture here. To him, it was an apostolic letter to the churches. But even he himself, in this letter, saying scripture, this is scripture, all of that is scripture. God speaking is scripture. Prophecy is the word of God. Everything is, everything is about the word of God. So this whole letter, if, you, if you're looking for one text to know what the Bible is about and why you should pay attention to it, it's a real issue for these people. Peter's saying, I'm about to pass away. Can I tell you the one thing that you should do? You will do well to pay attention to the word of God. You'll do well. So let's read that section. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing to you. Reveal yourself to us, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. He's saying, I think it is right, as long as I'm in this body, to stir, up, stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon. He's saying, I'm going to die soon. As our Lord Jesus made it clear to me. So he had a meeting with Jesus, and Jesus said, I'll see you soon. <laughs> I'll see you soon. And I will make every effort. You know what's so funny about that? Because the previous five verses he's saying you should make every effort 
to add to your faith virtue and to your virtue, virtue knowledge and to knowledge godliness and to godliness love and to love, you know, the greatest thing. And he's, he's saying, now I am going to make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able to at any time recall these things. God, we thank you for Peter. It's 2,000 years later, we're able to recall it. It's amazing. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths so that we, when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and that voice was born to him by the majestic glory. He's speaking about the transfiguration on the mountain. We, him, James, and John were right there with Jesus on the mountain, and God appeared in all his fullness, saying, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. He says, we ourselves heard this very voice born from the heaven. We were with him on that holy mountain, saying it's not a myth. I'm an eyewitness of that story. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention as a lamp shining in a dark place. Picture this, to pay attention to the word of the lamp shining in a dark place until the dawn downs all around you and the morning star rises in your heart, knowing that this, first of all, no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. It's um, three blocks. It's a lot of information. I know it. So I'm going to slowly just unpack it for you. But it's beautiful. Every bit of these phrases. The main phrase we're paying attention to today is, <laughs> paying attention, is the word that says, you'll do well to pay attention to the word. You'll do well. If that's all you take away today, I'm going to say, you will do well tomorrow morning to pay attention to the word. You'll do well tomorrow evening to pay attention to the word. You, you will do well. It will be good for you. First of all, how can I relate to this text? Tiflin. Thank you. How can I relate to this text? Thank you. First one is we recognize that this text, thank you, is um, like in Peter's day, we also, we shared about this two weeks, three weeks ago when I preached about First Peter. We, we also live in a culture where everything that we hold dear to and everything that we love and everything that we aspire to, everything that we say we believe is countercultural. Our culture is definitely pulling us in a direction. The, the, the masses, the media, the communication, even legislation these days are making it really difficult for us to proudly say what we believe, to confidently, to calmly say what we believe. It's really difficult. Things we value. I mean, if you switch on Netflix after the rugby, um, if you switch on a movie, if you read a novel, if you listen to music, the things in this world that we live to is counterculture. I'm not saying everything out there is bad. I'm just saying... There's a lot of bad out there that wants you to love other things, that wants you to live in a way where that says that, listen, if you desire it, then have it. Have it your way. You know, the original sin of Adam, have it your way. Frank Sinatra's song, number one song in hell one day, I did it my way. I did it my way. If you're going to sing it, I'm going to do it my way. You're going to end up there. So constant strain against the cultural tide, deception, you know, you can... Find any YouTube link that tells you that everything you believe in is a lie. Deception wants you to leave, live, believe something else. Seduction wants you to love other things, fleshly things. And thirdly, intimidation. If you say out loud that you really believe that God designed man and woman to be married, and that is holy, and that is proper, and that is right, it is countercultural. It can be considered as hate speech. Okay. So we live in the same culture. This was exactly the early church's issue. It was harder for them because they were living closer to China, Iraq, Afghanistan, and North India in their culture where they were a small minority and the law was based on other rules, which makes out laws what they say is good. Okay. So secondly, we also, and I find it for myself, we need to be reminded of the promises. Peter's saying of the great promises that we have in Christ Jesus. We need to be reminded that there is, it's worth holding on. It's worth saying no. It's worth enduring hardship for a short while. 
it's worth denying yourself for a short while because the reward is worth it. He's saying, hold on a little bit. And then he's saying, there are dangers out there. There is a lion roaring, walking around. I mean, if there really is a lion walking around, you'll do well to be weaponized. You'll do well to be weaponized. That's Peter's argument. Thirdly, the issue is with truth, that there is something like truth. And he's saying, we also need a resilience and a fruitfulness in our contemporary culture. So I just want to show you this before I delve into something. Um, when you ask the question, so what is the word of God? What is the word of God? I mean, if I ask the audience now, the group here, congregation, what is the word of God? You can give me probably 10 answers, and I'll say that probably you gave the same 10 answers that Peter uses in his text. It's amazing that because this whole chapter, this whole book is about holding on to the word of God, paying attention to the word of God so that you'll be fruitful and resilient. That is the call. But if you look at it, you'll see that he uses many words that we associate with the word of God. Firstly, he's saying that there was this audible voice of God that spoke from the heavens that I heard. Peter's saying, I heard it. I was there when the voice came. And it's not just me. It's not just me that being crazy. James was there. Jesus was there. And John was there. And we heard it. And it's not the only time, a few times, but there was the audible voice of God. And he's saying that scripture does record the audible voice of God that we should pay attention to. Secondly, he's saying the word of God he associates with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the gospel is my testimony and my story of the fact that I saw that Jesus did these miracles. He lived a sinless life. He, was, he suffered. He was executed on a cross. I saw him die. We went to the grave. It was empty. He resurrected and he appeared to us. That is the gospel. He's saying, I was there. It's not a myth. And he's saying that my testimony, my gospel, he regards as the word of God. Faith comes by hearing this word. Faith comes by hearing. We, we hear it, we believe it. Faith does, and that saves us. He's saying the word of God contains the Old Testament prophets or the scriptures in verse 20 and chapter 3, verse 2. He's saying it's not just this, but God has been speaking through the ages. Through Moses the prophet, through Samuel, was speaking through Jeremiah, Isaiah, Hosea, and all the Malachi, the Italian prophet, all of them. All of them, he spoke, God spoke to us through them. But he's saying that the word of God is also flowing in your church right here now with prophecies being spoken. He's saying, how do we test that? Well, we test that with the same way we tested the other prophecies, knowing that it comes by the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit, God speaking to us. He's saying the commandments of Jesus in chapter 3, he uses a few phrases that you'll see up there. The commandments of Jesus, the teachings of Christ, the way in which we should live, is the word of God because he's saying he gave it to us and say, teach this to everyone, make disciples of everyone. Let people know that this is God's way, God's speaking. This is the way we should live. He's saying that the creation was created by the word of God. He's saying that judgment will come by the word of God saying the heavens will be torn about, revealing God like a garment being torn, and then the glory of God will come like a consuming fire and consume, reveal, and consume all sin in this world. It's amazing. He's saying it will come by the word of God again. And he's saying that it's amazing, yeah, when he writes it. <laughs> Apostolic legacy. Peter really had a confidence in who I am and what I am. Peter was writing scripture. He's saying, Paul is writing scripture. He says, you guys, you guys mess with Paul's writing on, on, on freedom in Christ, and you're making it license. He's saying, you're twisting it like you're twisting the other scriptures. <laughs> he's saying, Paul is writing scriptures, and he's saying, I am too. I have the right. It's amazing. And that's why he's saying, I'm leaving this to you. I'm making it with my effort. I'm learning from Paul. I'm writing this down so that you, when I'm gone, you have it from an eyewitness that saw Jesus die and resurrect. You have it from an eyewitness that this is true gospel. This is the way to live. So this is when he speaks about the, the word of God. So what is the nature of the word of God? What is the, the word of God is, firstly, and this is what I want to spend a little bit more time in today. He's saying the word of God is, firstly, it's not a myth. 
it is the truth. It's not a myth. It's not a myth. It's amazing that he had to say that to the people in those days when times were tough and they were going like, listen, it doesn't seem as though Jesus is really conquering or we are on the top, you know, we are the head and not the tail. It really doesn't seem like this. It's tough. And if you would see the number one argument against Christianity today is that it's a myth. It's the same story. It's a myth. It's just a story. It's just a good story, you know, and some theologians in seminaries also teach it's just a myth. It's just metaphors, good ethics in life. But a good pause there. But he's saying, no, it's, it's not a myth. He's saying, I am an eyewitness. And he's not saying I. He's saying, all of us, we are witnesses to this. There was moments, and he uses the transfiguration as an example, where he goes like, I was there. I was there. This really happened. This is, this is it blew my mind. I didn't know what to do. I was very awkward. I didn't know what to do. So I said, can I build you a tent? You know, can I pitch a tent here? <laughs> And then Jesus laughed, and the other disciples just went, Ach, Peter, alweer, staan nie bra, sit net en kyk, geniet hierdie, enjoy this, this is good, you know. But he was afraid. So there are a few things that I'm just going to mention that I think you know well when we say, how do you know the scriptures are not just a myth? How do you know the New Testament's not just a myth? Well, the first thing we have to say to one another is that the timing of this letter, 25, 30 years, after Jesus' ascension publicly. He's not the only eyewitness of the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. It's not enough time for a myth to take place. He's writing this. There's no scholarly disregard to say that Peter's letter was written later because we all know historically Peter died at the hands of Nero, crucified. And when he was crucified, he said, can you please crucify me upside down? He was crucified next to his wife in the Colosseum. And he's saying, I cannot die like Jesus. Let me hang upside down. I am not worthy. So it's amazing. So it's short. It's, the timing is just too short. And, and his writing is one of the later New Testament writings because they call it the impregnable quartet. First and second Corinthians, you can see a young Paul there, still frustrated, a little bit more passionate, angry that the early church, the Corinthian church, was so sexual and so... He's still tolerating idolatry. He's angry and frustrated at them. And he, he's still trying to figure out the metaphors. What is the church? You know, he starts with, you are the field, I'm the building, oh, I'm the sower. Mm, you are, uh, I'm fellow workers with you in this field. You are a building, I'm a, no, you're, you're a temple. Ah, you're a temple. And I'm participating with you. God's the real builder, but I'm a contractor. And he's saying, ah, you are the body of Christ. So he's still trying to figure out but the point is, in those early letters, First and Second Corinthians, Romans, and Galatians, the issues with which the early church is fighting is big. They have legitimacy because it's Paul writing, one who is historically known to persecute and to kill Christians, who were converted because he saw the living Jesus, had to convince the church that I am one of you, had to convince the apostles that I am one of you. It took them a while to get it. So the, the big conversion of this man, and then what does he write about the whole time? The legitimacy of the crucifixion, death, and the resurrection of Jesus is the big issue in those letters. And how do you live then? So it's too short. 15 years is a bit too short to make a myth <laughs> that sticks because all the witnesses were there. First thing. Second big thing is in these writings, in the scriptures in the New Testament, I just want to like I just mentioned that one example of Peter being awkward. <laughs> the apostles looked stupid, very stupid, in the epistles and in the gospels. They look foolish. They, they're awkward. They constantly fight. If, if you want to manufacture something where you say, come to our movement because we are so great and we are teaching the truth, you, you will not write how immature you are bickering about who's the greatest the whole time. You, won't, you will leave out those bits where Jesus said to you, Ach, you have little faith. Ach, you have little faith. Ach, you, the whole time. It's like, Ach, prachtig. You, you won't write about your fears and how afraid you, you will write, make yourself big. You know, if you want a myth, 
you will do these things. Um, even Peter in Galatians and in Acts, where Peter and Paul, where Paul had to say to Peter, you are a racist and you are denying Christ's body because they were fighting about shall we eat with the Gentiles or not? You would just leave out those bits, you know? It's like, because it's not a good story. Thirdly, <clears throat> they're just saying that there's a benefit for the apostles. I mean, if, if this was a myth, what's the benefit? W what do you benefit? This is uh, C.S. Lewis's big thing. What do you benefit by going around saying that I saw Jesus as a resurrected Lord and you should bow to him and they say, your answer is off with your head. I mean, what's the benefit for you? There's no, if you want to start a movement where you want to spread a myth, it will be to create some sense of power for you, some sense of prosperity for you, something, you're going to benefit. You're going to only spread something that benefits you. But these guys were convinced that what they saw were real and they were spreading it knowing that I'm going to be killed from this letter. I'm going to be killed soon after this letter because I know. So I just want to leave you a legacy. This is really true. So I'm not dying for a lie. I'm not lying. I'm not, I'm not pronouncing this for anything. And then the last one is just um, the Gospels and the New Testament of Acts is filled with insignificant details. Don't take me wrong here. It's, it's, it's not myth that's made up where every part of the story means something. It's, um, especially in those days, we don't waste paper and writing. It's filled with, I mean, Acts chapter 4, the boats. Um, and Jesus went into a boat, and just before he started preaching, he's saying, and there were many other boats around him. I'm like, what is the deep meaning of that text? Now, the eyewitness, Peter, through Mark, is just saying, we just chose one. It's like just a story. Or uh, the crucifixion or the, the uh, arrest of Jesus in the garden. And there was a man who fled naked. <laughs> like, why do you write that? Because it made an impact on me. <laughs> it's like, this is happening. And then there's a crazy man. His clothes were ripped off and he ran naked. Why do you add that? There's no deep meaning. It's just, it really happened. If there's a naked man running through this church today, you'll say that Ross spoke a powerful message about paying attention to God's word. And there was a naked man that ran through the church. It's an eyewitness account. You know, it's like, so all of it's filled with these, like, it's just, a, it's just part of the story. It's a story. It's, 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 it's written in a genre that is, this is just a document. It's definitely compiled to focus attention on certain bits, but it's just eyewitness account. So it's amazing. So it's not a myth. He's saying it's truth. You can bank on it. You can bank on this is true. This is what he's saying to the guys. Guys, I know that the pressure's on and you would rather run away. But I can tell you that this is true. So when you see me die at the hands of Nero, just know that I'm not dying for a lie. This is true. Secondly, he's saying that this is 100% God and 100% man. Just like Jesus. This word that you have in front of you is 100% of God. And no angel wrote it. It was men who wrote what the word there is carried along or moved. And the Greek word there just speaks about when Marguerite started swimming, I would swim with her in the pool or walk with her. She would really swim, but she would be moved by me. She, would, she does the swimming. I'm definitely determining the direction, pace, and the, the fact that she survives. <laughs> She's really swimming, but I'm the one moving her. It's like someone swimming through a current through a river. You are really swimming, and the current is really <laughs> taking you that way. So the direction and the power and the speed is determined by something else. He's saying that this is definitely, and we can see Peter writing Mark, which is different from Dr. Luke carefully studying which is different from the lawyer Paul, which is different from, I don't know, John with his poetic, image-rich depth in meaning but simplicity. We can see Nehemia being Nehemia, you know, even revealing all his weaknesses because he's just Nehemia. And we can see David in his Psalms versus Moses' psalm. It's not the same, it's not the same writer. But we pick up that there is something about the character and the richness and the 
the life in this scripture, which is God. And he's saying that this is all God and it's all man. It's all God and all man, you know. It's definitely, I did this, but I'm moved by God. He's saying that no scripture comes from personal interpretation or personal speaking, but men were moved by God. It's moving of God. So this is 100, the word of God is not a myth, it's truth. It's 100% God and 100% man. He's saying that the word of God is about God's reign and restoration in Jesus. Listen, this is a big one. Um, let me just take that text for you. Verse 16, we do not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The big thing in all of scripture, the culmination, the coming together, the, the, the point that everyone wants to see through the ages is that it really is about Jesus coming to make all things new. That's the goal of all scripture. It's the many, Jesus in the MRS, you'll see it in your Lectio series this week. Jesus in, Acts, in Luke chapter 24, after his resurrection, he appeared to the disciples. They didn't know what to do now. I mean, Jesus was dead, now resurrected. What must I do with my life? Jerusalem isn't the safe space for any of Jesus' disciples. So what do they do in the middle of the night? They just fly. They walk out. They walk away. They walk to Emmaus. They walk a few miles away. They don't know what to do. They're disillusioned. They don't know what to do with this whole story. And then all of a sudden, this couple meets a man on the road whom they can't recognize, but they're walking with him. And they're saying, what are you talking about? And he's saying, no, didn't, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? Don't you know what happened here? And he's saying, no, tell me. He's saying, no, that he died. And then Jesus started to unfold all the scriptures, starting with Moses through the prophets and the Psalms, saying, couldn't you see that this should have happened? Can't you see that all of the scriptures, all of the scriptures have one goal to show you that God would send his son who would become the Messiah crowned on a cross to die for your stead and resurrect to bring an end to sin, suffering, and Satan's reign. This is the scripture. So Jesus is the, we call it in, in, in hermeneutics, in studying scripture, we call it the Christocentric principle that every single text ultimately points to Jesus, that Jesus is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets, his own word. Every single epistle aims not to tell you that what rules you should live by or how you can wield the kingdom promises for your prosperity. The goal is so that you can know who Jesus is. And like Paul says, that I may know him and become like him. That's it. That's it. Colossians, all things were reconciled in, in Christ by God. All things. Revelation, he alone, everyone stops and worships the Lamb like we did today. The Lamb of God who takes away. You are worthy to receive all power, glory, and strength and to reign. That's it. He is called the Word of God. So it really is that. And then the fourth point, as we can see in Paul's text here, he's saying that the Scripture really is, isn't light reading, isn't informative reading, isn't just inspirational. It really has to do with death and life. And if you read Seriously, just consider the context of Peter's writing. You'll say that this is, this is big stuff, boys. This is not about having a better life. This is not the five principles to a happy, happy marriage. This is not how to, how to make God make me prosper in all things or to be beautiful and powerful for Jesus. It's about life and death. It's about you ending in darkness or ending in light. It's like you walking in darkness or walking in light. Metaphors for it's about salvation or about corruption. And Peter's intent is to say, guys, you will fall away unless you pay attention to these words. You will fall away unless you pay attention to these words. I wish I could say it stronger in a nicer way for you. But unless you pay attention to the word, you will fall away because you will love the things of this world unless you pay attention to the word. Be reminded constantly of the word. Be reminded constantly. He's saying you have to. Is um, verse 19. It's so a mooi prankie. You saw that I 
stopped it when I read it, verse 19. And we have this prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention. And he's saying it's like a lamp that you look at because it's so very dark outside. So you fix your eyes on the light because in the light you will feel safe and everything is clear. Because in the light you can see what's happening, who you are and where you are. In the darkness you can't. In the light you know that things will be okay because you can see and because you feel warm. He's saying, because it's dark outside. He's saying, you look at, you look at that light until the sun rises in righteousness all around you. Because this little light is a picture. It's just a little faint, it's a faint light. It's a clear enough in the darkness. But this little light, you look at it, it's a picture and a hope that the sun will rise all around and all darkness will be eliminated. In the presence of this light, I can see and I feel safe. It will be like that forever when the word returns fully, when his kingdom comes, the kingdom of the light, where there will be no more sun or moon because God himself is our light. That's what he's saying. But he's saying something else. He's saying, you look at that light until the morning star of hope is shaped in your hearts. Something on the inside. Something on the inside. The light saying that Christ will illuminate your heart. That Christ will give you a revelation. That this is not just knowledge, but it really changes who you are. There's a rising of this moon, of this light, this um, morning star in your heart. Smoy, eh? This Smoy. Slacker. It's like a, if it was like one of my friends that would say, shake the person next to you and say, this is good stuff, dude. Peter's writing good stuff. Okay, so, what do we do? What do we do? Peter says five things in this text. You could have seen it probably. Let me just say it anyway. First thing, he's saying, trust the word. He's saying, guys, you can bank on this word. He's saying, someone died for it, and I'm about to die for it. <laughs> this is not a myth. This is true stuff. He's saying, me writing this down, I'm signing my own death. So I know it's going to happen. You can trust this word. You don't have to doubt. You can trust. And if you have doubt, pray to him and search the scriptures until you trust it. But you can trust this word. He's saying, you can bank your life on these words, the declaration of your, the destination, how you live this life. He who is like a wise man, Jesus saying, you can build on this rock. This rock won't shake when the storm comes. This house won't be blown away. You build your life on these principles, you will stand, Jesus said. Secondly, he's saying you need reminding of these words. And that is var. That is var. Uh, recently, it was my birthday. Again, I have one every year. And uh, saying, <laughs> don't worry, five jokes, leaving it. Recently, it was my birthday, and one or two people sent me a message, and I know the intent is very good. Let me just say where I am. The intent was, I really pray that God will reveal new things to you. I know that this new season and new stuff, and I'm like, thank you, thank you. From where I stand, can I just be obedient to the truth that I have? This is my, this is my begeerte. Long obedience in the same direction. Can I just be faithful with what I have? Can I just walk out what I've received now. I don't desire a new vision or new stuff for now. The whole world is all full of new visions and new stuff, and I'm just sort of looking at those buildings, and they go like, you build your life in one vision, and then another vision, and, then, and you look like a, some Dr. Sluice's houses, you know, what's his royal doll house or something. It's like weird. So now I want to, for me, I just want to, I want to walk out with what Jesus said to me to do. And looking for me, looking into the scriptures, reminds me of what is foundational and what is good. It's not a cognitive reminder. Every time I read it, it does something to my heart. It makes me want to do this thing. It reminds me of the goodness of God in the past to the generations and faithful generations for years. And I just want to pay attention to remind, to remind myself this is who Jesus is, this is how Jesus lived, and this is how Jesus revealed himself to the apostles, and this is what he invites us into. This is who God was and what he said to Israel, to the exiles, to everyone. I just want to be faithful to this God who has been faithful to his people forever. 
I remind myself of God's faithfulness. I pray that I may emulate his faithfulness. Remind myself. And then he's saying you have to keep the word in front of your eyes. Don't neglect it. Peter's, the big reason why he's writing is obviously what I said 50 times, is keep it in front of your eyes. And he's not saying anything new. He's writing to Jewish guys who were told to keep the word in front of their eyes like a, like a little box in front of their eyelids and like a band around their right hand. That the morning you wake up, you remind your children of the law. The evening you go to bed, you tell them about the law. When you go out the house, you're reminded that there is Yahweh is faithful to you. When you come back, you remind them of the law. When you're on the way and when you sit down, he says, parents, instruct, remind, it, let your, pay attention to the word. Pay attention to the word. Parents, pay attention and teach your children. Adults, teach your, remind yourself, pay attention. Just look at it. Don't let it miss you. What are you paying attention to? What are you following? What do you constantly look to? He's saying, just look to this. Just look to this. Look to this. Fourth, meditate on the word. We're going to go into that next week, but it literally just means, verse 19, he said, we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you'll do well to pay attention as a light shining in dark place. He's saying, until the dawn, until the day dawns and the morning star rises, he's saying, you meditate, you murmurate, you sing about it, you mum about it, you herko, regurgitate, yeah, yeah, regurgitate something else. <laughs> ruminate is the word. Thank you, Dale. You ruminate it, you herko it, you just keep it here. You keep it here you're like a cow. You know, just keep keep chewing the word. Just keep chewing, chewing the word until 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 it forms something in you, until it, it changes who you are, it changes your appetite and everything. I'll get into that next week. And he's saying, We need help from the Holy Spirit. This is what I love what Paul's saying. He's saying, guys, bluntly, a prophecy, you're reading Jeremiah. Jeremiah comes from God. If you want to understand Jeremiah, ask God. You need the Holy Spirit. Very simple. He's saying the word is not the book like a, like a real, dull, real dull story. He's saying there's a deep inspired author. These words... Peter said to Jesus, why, why, why should we run away? You alone have the words of life. And he does something. It gives life on the inside. Your words have life. I mean, the word of God was, was what created everything, Peter says. The word of God will be the final judgment, the cause. It's simply a word. It's amazing if you read Revelation chapter 19. It builds up to this climatic, intergalactic, <laughs> cosm, cosmo, po, cosmic. Yeah, it's a big word. I'm just going big now. Like warfare, my wife says, stop. Uh, anyway, so it goes into this final massive conflict, and then all the armies are ready. And then it says, and the word said, enough, and it's over. <laughs> it's sort of a, a letdown to an awesome book. But the point is, the word has the, all the power and all the authority. It was the word that, storm, that stilled the storm that drowned the disciples nearly. It was the word who called Lazarus out of death to life. It was the word who opened the eyes of the blind. It was the word who let that lame man say, stand up and walk. It was the word who cleansed the lepers. It's the word of God. Peter's saying that it's here. And we need the Holy Spirit to reveal it to us. So just pray and say, God. So, and this is what Peter's saying. He's saying that, that there's a roaring lion at the end of his just the previous page. It's a roaring lion walking around. Be sober, be vigilant. If, there's a, if there really is danger in the world, if Peter really was serious saying, you, you get to pay attention to this or die, then I think it's good for us to have a weapon, a sword. If there really is a sin in this world that is deadly and rotting us from the inside, causing decay to our relationships, our identity, our marriages, to our course of life, then, then we need the word that is a cure. And he's saying, pay attention. Just pay attention to it. Urgency. So, last scripture, in closing, you'll do well to pay attention to this word as a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises. Stay in the word until the word heightens. I'm going to close with a story that you know well. 
Oh, I don't know if you know it well. King James Version of the Bible, King James Authorized Version, really revolutionized the world at the end of the Protestant Reformation. But the man who pioneered it was a man called, or one of the guys that we know well from England side. We know Luther from Germany, Calvin later from Austria. We know Zwigli from, from the Swiss. But Tyndale is someone that we don't really know that well because it's the English history. And because of the war, we step away from that. But he say Tyndale was a man born at the end of the 14th century, executed on the 6th of October, just two weeks ago, in, um, in the Netherlands, actually, by the Pope um, on the 6th of October, 1536. Tyndale was a, like uh, C.S. Lewis, a linguist, a student of languages. And he started reading, obviously because of his Latin background, he started reading the scriptures, he had access to the scriptures, which no one else had. In his day, every single priest had a chained Bible. It is a Bible literally chained to the pulpit. The Bible was chained to the pulpit. Every church had a Bible, because it's so expensive, written in copies, later printed by Gutenberg's Press, but everyone had a copy and only the priest was authorized to study, to read, and to preach from that. And the priest rarely ever did that. They preached what they were told to preach. So that was the reason for the Reformation, because of the corruption in the priesthood in the day. And him, a linguist, knew that these guys were talking nonsense. They were preaching not what the Bible says. They were preaching what benefited the institution of the Roman church, the political power and the wealth. And that really bothered him. So he started speaking up and he started, he asked after months of request, can, I'm a linguist, would you mind if I translate this to English? And there was great revolt because of the power and corruption. And he started speaking up with Luther about that. Eventually, he did start writing a few pamphlets. He started with the Gospel of John. The page that you see there is his first printed John Bible in his day in 22, 1522. First, first pages of John's gospel writing. And there was a massive inquisition about him. They tried to kill him. He fled. He eventually he found that he couldn't stay there anymore. And he had to flee into, um, into Austria, into the Netherlands eventually, where he was executed. But not until he translated the New Testament, until he translated most of the Bible. He couldn't finish everything, but he translated most of the Bible into English. And eventually he was executed because he dared to print the Bible for common people. He's famous for that saying there that says, he's saying it to the Pope. He wrote it to the Pope. <laughs> he's not afraid. Huh? Prophets. He's writing, if God spare my life, I will make a boy that drives the plow shed, drives the plow, know more about the scriptures than you do. <laughs> he's saying, I will make the commoner in England know more about the Bible and more about the scriptures than you priests. And that was sort of the final straw. He was executed uh, at, a, at a fire staple. He was uh, burned, burned at the stake, but because of the grace of the local, local executioner, they strangled him to death and then burned his body. Um, but it's amazing. The King James Bible is 85 to 90 percent of his translation. Uh, the Gutenberg Bible came out before that. That was fully his Bible with a few comments on it. But the point is this man had a passion that he could see the church in England was not following or loving Jesus because they didn't have access to the scriptures. Melissa was saying earlier today that we have a few Bibles. I'm like that. I got a new Bible for my birthday, not this one, but up there, just a a prayer Bible with notes and stuff, and I, I so love it. I so love reading a fresh Bible. The point is we have so many Bibles. Uh, someone once said that the Bible is, is the most printed, most distributed, most sold document least read <laughs> in all of America. I want to invite you to pay attention to the Scriptures, to pay attention to it. Don't say to me there is no time I'm going to say, pay attention to it. 
put it in your car when you drive, something that you can look at and fix your eyes on it. Put it as a screensaver, put it in stickies in your Bible, toilet, download the Lexio app on your phone, pay attention to the scriptures because it's life. It's life. It will enlighten your circumstance and your darkness. It will. In every single counseling case that we have, we find that paying attention to someone hearing the word of God and agreeing with it brings light, brings hope, brings strength. I want to invite you to pay attention to the scriptures. I want to invite you. Not all the churches here because last yesterday we had cricket, Anglo Boer World, cricket, rugby, and Formula One. Don't you want to take this message to your small groups? Encourage them, exhort them to pay attention to the scripture because it is life and it will keep you from decay. It will keep you from hopelessness. It will encourage your hearts to witness Christ lively. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your word, God. We thank you, Lord, that your words are life indeed. It's sweeter than a honeycomb, God. It's more precious than gold. Your word gives life, God. Thank you, Jesus, that you are the word made manifest to us. You are the word made manifest to us. God, and with the angels this morning, we sang to you, the Lamb of God, the Word of God, who took away the sins of the world, Lord. God, we thank you that your Word speaks to us. It stills storms. It changes seasons. It brings life and healing. It brings revelation. And Lord, it also has the ability, like, like Paul said, God, to separate, to divide that which is of the flesh and that which is of the Spirit. And God, we pray in Jesus' name that you will speak to us, you will cement us in our hearts, that your word will have its desired effect, that we may love you and love your word. In Jesus' name. I want to invite you, just as Greg plays a little bit, don't you want to turn to the person next to you and say from the things that you heard today in Peter's, in Peter's writing, what moved you most? What's going to stay with you when you leave here? And how will you respond? Okay, don't you want to say, just do that? How will you respond? What moved you and how will you respond to God?